Greetings, Risk Five friends. Well, it's been a long slog trying to get this ALU up and running. So here I have boards that I've built, and this is revision B, and this is revision C, and this is the current revision, revision D. I don't even know what happened with revision A. I think it was just messed up from the very beginning and I didn't even try it. So what happened was with uh, revision B, I found that the counters that I was using to load the ROMs into the RAMs were just the wrong counters and the wrong circuitry. So this never actually booted up. So then I went to revision C and I changed the counters to the proper chips and I thought I had everything, you know, set up and running and when I tested it, uh, it didn't work. So at that point I just decided to sit down and write a complete Verilog simulation of the board for every single chip and for every connection between chips and I found a lot of things wrong as a result of simulating the board in Verilog, which is a good thing because now I know, well, number one, I can't actually design something like this and keep it all straight without any testing. Um, number two, it tells me that hardware design is essentially like software design. You have to test your uh, circuitry uh, through simulation or formal verification or something in order to make sure that it works the way you intended it to work. Uh, let's see, what else did I learn? What else did we learn? Well, um, I've learned that to solder chips onto a board you need to use plenty of flux and I actually now have this uh, bottle of flux that I got off eBay. It's Kester 186, no clean. Well, it says it's no clean, but I don't know. The board certainly needed cleaning. Um, the interesting thing that I found is that I looked online for Kester 186, and basically all I found were these bottles, and they look kind of sketchy, you know, because they have these homemade labels on it, and I'm like, what's going on? Why can't I just go to Kester and buy these? Well, it turns out, at least I think, Kester only sells like these huge five gallon drums of these things basically. So, you know, what resellers do is they buy a large uh, container of it and then they break it up into small bottles and sell it to you at a profit, um, which is great, I think, actually. Uh, so I found a whole bunch of things wrong with this. It wasn't loading the RAMs properly. Some of the logic was screwed up. Um, some of the buffers were actually um, connected to each other, their outputs were connected to each other at certain times. So it was really horrible. So after I simulated everything and fixed all the problems, I came up with revision D and that's what we're going to test today. So here we go and I have my, what I've been calling my scoreboard because it's basically a bunch of lights and jumpers. Uh, and I've got my booter over here. I did actually find, based on simulation, that the booter was uh, doing a little bit of the wrong thing. It was actually strobing clock then right when it should have strobed right and then clock. Uh, which kind of makes sense because when you reset the thing, the counter is set to zero and then you want to write address zero into the RAMs. Then you want to clock the counter so that you move to address one. So you write first and then clock after that. Um, so what I'm going to do is just plug this in and see what happens. So here is revision D. It goes right in the back. Also you might notice that on this side I replaced the uh, stupid thing, which were these useless connectors over here, with just a power LED and an ALU enabled LED. Okay, so I am going to power up and let's see what happens. All right, power LED is on, we're booting, and we're booted. So that's the theory anyway. Well, I've got the function set to XOR 
So we've got XOR 0010, so this is actually 0010. And let's see if we get any XOR functionality out of this thing. So let's go ahead and pull the jumper to enable the ALU. All right, so we've got one input has uh, this bit set and this bit is not set, which means that the output should be set, and it is. It is a little bit hard to see because the input LED is uh, kind of dim just because of the resistor selections that I used. I wanted to make this sort of like a weak pull up so that if there was any circuitry outputting to this bit, uh, that the jumper wouldn't actually short the output. All right, well, if this is XOR, then in theory, I can set the same bit on the other input and the output bit should go out. Let's see if that actually works. Okay, and indeed, that actually worked. So I can take the input bit off, and then if I take the other input bit off, that's an XOR function. Well, let's see if the other bits actually work. So I'm simply going to work my way. One, two, three, four, five, okay, six, seven, and so on. All right, um, that seems to work. So let's try uh, some other function. Uh, let's try the OR function. So the OR function means that I need to set bit one as a function. Okay, and logic OR means that if both bits are zero, then the output is zero. If any one of the bits is one, then the output should be one. So there's one, and if I set it on the other input, there is one as well. And if I set both inputs, the output is one. So that is the OR function. And I can just, you know, run through the bits. And so far, that all seems to work pretty well. All right, let's change the function to AND. So I'm going to set function zero bit. All right, so now we're set up to do an AND. So with an AND, uh, only if the bits on both input are set will there be an output. So we have, oops, I missed the pins on that one. All right, so we have nothing on the output and we have nothing on the output. And when we set both inputs, get the jumper in the right way, that's AND. All right. All right. Let's do something much more complicated, which is add. So for add, function is zero. So uh, let's add one to zero, and we should get an output of one. So that's correct. Let's add one plus one, and the output should be two. And that is correct as well. Excellent. Let's add uh, three plus one, and the output should be four. Excellent. So far, so good. And let's add three plus zero, and the output should be three. Excellent. So far, so good. Um, let us also, because this has bit slices of four bits each, let's go ahead and add 1 plus 15 to make sure that we're getting spillover into the next bit slice. So there's 15. Now I'm just going to add 1. and we properly get 16. Excellent. So, so far, this seems to work pretty well. Uh, let's try a subtraction. All right, so for a subtraction, function bit three needs to be set. 
So that's zero, one, two, three. That should be function bit. Oops, I got the jumper in backwards. All right, so that's function bit three. So we're now set up to do a subtraction. So zero minus zero is zero. Uh, and it's going to do, let's see, I think it's RS1 minus RS2. So if I have RS1 set to one, we should have one minus zero is one. And one minus one should be zero. Excellent. Now, zero minus one should be negative one, or all ones. And there we go, all ones. So subtraction actually seems to be working properly. Well, according to my limited testing. All right, uh, there are a few other uh, functions to try. One of them is set if equal. So with set if equal, if both inputs are equal, then I think it's bit zero should go high. Otherwise it should remain low. So let's go ahead and set up function bits zero and two. All right, well, zero is equal to zero, so that's good. Uh, let's um, just choose some bit, like bit seven. All right, well, that's obviously not equal. Uh, let's uh, set bit one on the other one. That's obviously not equal. Let's also set bit seven on the second input. That is also not equal, and if both bit sevens are high, then we're equal. All right, so that's set if equal. All right, we've got two other functions, set if less than and set if less than unsigned. So let's see if we can get that tested. Uh, so let's try set if less than signed first. Okay, so I've set up the function. Uh, okay, so set if less than. Obviously, zero is not less than zero. Uh, and I believe it is RS1 less than RS2. So let's set RS1 to zero and RS2 to one. And the question is, is zero less than one? The answer should be yes. And indeed, the answer is yes. And of course, is one less than zero? The answer is no. Now this is signed. So if I set the 31st bit or the highest significant bit on RS1, what that actually is, is the most negative value. So we're going to see if the most negative value is less than zero. And of course it should be. This is signed. And indeed it is. Notice that if I try to ask is one less than zero, the answer is no. So that bit obviously is an important bit. It indicates that RS1 is negative. All right, now, if we try an unsigned compare, that's actually gonna turn out to be different. So let me set the function for unsigned comparison. All right, so we're checking is RS1 less than RS2. Now, of course, it's not. Uh, if I set a one on RS2, then the answer is yes. Now, if I set the most significant bit on RS1, this is actually some high positive number. And of course, that positive number is not going to be less than one. And there you go. And I can even pull this off. So that high positive number is not less than zero when you do an unsigned comparison. So 
it looks like we've succeeded in creating an ALU. So what this shows is that in hardware, as in software, testing is important, especially when you have something as complex as this. Now, the reason that I didn't go straight to testing is that I have always designed circuits with very few chips where I could hold the entire design in my mind and understand everything about it because it was just so simple. Well, this is probably the most complex circuit that I've ever put together in my life, and it turns out to be beyond the complexity threshold that I can handle. So imagine now that you're the designer of this board, which is a floating point unit uh, from the, I think, early 80s. Well, there's no way that you could just write the circuit down and assume that it's just gonna work. I am sure that they must have done some kind of simulation, some sort of testing, some sort of validation that this design actually worked. This contains about 600 chips. So yeah, um, I think that they didn't just, you know, do what I did and throw together a circuit, get the printed circuit board, solder all the chips, and then see if it worked. So anyway, uh, I've learned something, we've learned something, We've learned a whole bunch of things. Number one, test your hardware uh, in simulation first, then order the PCBs. Uh, something else, you're going to want to test every chip for bridges between consecutive pins. Um, I thought that I was doing well with uh, my Revision D board and I didn't see any bridges. And then I tested every single pin and I found one bridge, which could have been the end of this board. So test your bridges. When you are soldering, use plenty of flux like Lewis Rossman does. Um, I found that the more flux you put, uh, the easier the chips would solder on and the fewer bridges that you would make. And also when you created a bridge, just stick more flux on it, run the solder iron, run the soldering iron on it and the bridge is gone. Um, especially on those flash chips, which have very fine pitch. Lewis Rossman probably deals with even finer pitch than I do, uh, but this is, this is probably the limit of, of my capabilities. Um, let's see, uh, number three, have plenty of indicators, and number four, uh, when you are testing a board, test it after you build it, and make sure that you have appropriate testing gear. So I think that the next thing that I'm going to do is see how fast this thing can actually add so, or subtract. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna subtract zero from one. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna subtract one from zero actually, and all the lights should turn on. So basically this is exercising a lot of the ALU. And I'm simply going to uh, hook up a, uh, an oscilloscope and I'm going to hook up a signal generator to one of the bits and we'll see how fast we can actually go. Now in simulation, I found that 10 megahertz is probably the limit of this. Um, I could probably go to 20 megahertz, but beyond that, uh, the circuit would not settle. So when I did my simulations, I actually simulated um, actually the maximum delay on some of these chips. So let's see what happens. So again, just to make sure, I'm going to take zero and subtract one. So this is me doing it manually and all the LEDs on the output light up. Now I'm going to keep this board in place because, well, that's how I'm going to connect the signals up. Now you might ask, well, okay, so the ALU is going to be driving 32 LEDs. Uh, isn't that going to slow things down? And the answer is, well, yes and no. Uh, the ALU is designed so that it has buffers on the output, and buffers, of course, can do high uh, currents. And, uh, well, this is actually a pretty good uh, limit test because I don't think that I'll be drawing as much current as these LEDs do. So, just to start, I've set up my function generator for 5 hertz. All right, so we're doing some subtraction at 5 hertz. So now I can just say increase the speed. Okay, so that's 10 hertz. 
So now we're at 20 hertz, and of course, uh, you know, the lights are flickering, and you can just sort of make it out, but obviously if I go any higher, uh, you won't be able to see the flickering at all. So now I need to pull out the oscilloscope. Okay, so here I've got the oscilloscope hooked up to one of the output bits, and we can see that we are outputting a nice square wave. Uh, let's see, the time is uh, 10 milliseconds per division, and it looks like we've got about two and a half divisions. So that's uh, 25 milliseconds, which is, uh, well, actually it's five divisions per cycle, which is 20 hertz. So uh, let's go ahead and increase the frequency and see what happens. So I'm going to now increase the frequency to, well, let's go for broke, one megahertz. Everything down, and there we go. So this is 200 nanoseconds per division, and we've got five divisions per cycle, which is one microsecond per cycle, or one megahertz. So we can successfully subtract at one megahertz, which is great. Now, can we go to two megahertz? And it certainly looks like we can. All right, now, can we go to three megahertz? Sure, four, yeah. Now you can see some bouncing. Um, that's a little disturbing to me. All right, let's go for five megahertz. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So this is subtracting at 10 megahertz and we've got um, quite a bit of bouncing going on. So it could be the probe that I'm using. Um, it could be the fact that uh, this board, the scoreboard, is actually not buffered. So it's, you know, really not the right board for high speed, um, for high speed anything to put on the bus. Uh, but, I mean, you can see the basic waveform. So we are going at 10 megahertz. Let's see if I can bump up the frequency even more to say 20 megahertz. And you can see that, you know, we are sort of getting a 20 megahertz wave. Um, and right now I'm probably reaching the limitations of the board, given, you know, the, the horrible impedance of this uh, scoreboard. Can I go any higher with this frequency? Well, I can only go to 25 megahertz. Um, and yeah, it's really kind of hard to say. Um, obviously, we do have a square wave. Uh, so something's going on, but, you know, I don't know if it's uh, the correct square wave. It, it does look kind of asymmetrical. So, you know, we can call it 20 megahertz. So that's pretty good. I think I'm pretty satisfied with this. So that's about it for the ALU design. I really appreciate you sticking with me through my ALU struggles. And hopefully we can continue with the RISC-V processor now that we've gotten past this difficulty. So uh, please click like down below, or even dislike if you didn't like this video. That's fine too. Uh, hit subscribe if you haven't subscribed so that you can see uh, all the designs that I'm doing. And there's a little bell icon which should hopefully uh, notify you when new videos come around. Also check my Patreon links and also everything that I do will be posted to GitHub. Again, the link is down below. Thanks very much, and I will see you on the next video. I'm building a RISC-V processor, not on an FPGA.